good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to this roundtable discussion hosted by Mazar's Centre for Audit Committee and Investor Dialogue and in association with Board Agenda. As you know, the title for this discussion is Navigating ESG and I think we can all agree that the task of navigation continues to get ever more complicated and ever more challenging. Um, increasingly, environmental, social and governance factors inform the decision that every organisation makes from its day-to-day -day operational choices all the way through to its long-term strategic planning. Every business has its own priorities. They may not share the same views or the same goals, but they have collectively embraced the idea that financial performance is no longer their sole objective. And of course, that has implications for every part of the organisation and the boards that oversee them. I saw some research the other day, um, conducted specifically with audit committees actually, suggesting that two thirds of organisations now publish a sustainability or ESG related report. Why ask audit committees specifically about ESG? Well, one reason is the role that the committee has to play in assurance. 69% of respondents in that research said their committees were actively discussing obtaining third party assurance on components of ESG and sustainability data. But I think more broadly, in this new world of ESG, the audit committee's role is going to go much more widely than simply thinking about insurance. If we agree that ESG risk, whether it's climate change dangers or the fear of reputational risk, is mounting, it must make sense that the board members most likely to be focused on risk within the organisation are the ones who engage with these issues. Step forward the audit committee. That then is the backdrop for the discussion that we're going to have this afternoon. And I'm joined by some brilliant panellists with exactly the right kind of expertise and experience to talk us through the challenges and questions facing audit committees as they navigate their way through ESG. So let me just take a moment to introduce them. First of all, on my left, we've got Shona Jemmett Page, who's an audit committee chair and a, a prolific non-executive director. Um, Shona spent the first, year of her, first 20 years of her career in a variety of roles at KPMG, at Unilever, and latterly as chief operating officer at CDC Group. Um, she left there in 2012, and since then she's been focused on non-executive appointments. She's recently been appointed to the board of Aviva. Uh, she's a non-executive chairman of two listed investment trusts, including Greencoat UK Wind, which obviously, uh, with its sustainable energy focus, is particularly relevant to our conversation, and Cordiant Digital Infrastructure. Um, moving on from Shona, to her left, uh, we have um, Hans Christoph Hurt. He's the executive director of EOS at uh, Federated Hermes. It's a role where he leads a multinational team based in London in the US, and he oversees the global engagement program and the quality of the services that EOS provides to its clients around the world. Prior to joining Hermes, Hans worked with an international law firm, Ashursts. He's the author of numerous publications on corporate governance and law, as well as responsible investment and stewardship. Um, to Hans' left, we have uh, Maud Godry, who's global co-head of sustainability at Mazars. She's based in Paris, so we're fortunate to have her here with us in London today. Um, she rejoined Mazars in June 2020 after a decade spent in the investment banking division at Societe Generale. Today, her job's to lead those uh, global sustainability services. She's deeply involved in the EU sustainability reporting momentum, and she's the project lead for the EFRAG Project Task Force on Sustainability Reporting. And finally, last but definitely not least, joining us by screen rather than in the studio, we've got Leila Camden, who's the head of climate risk at HSBC. Um, she's responsible for enabling the bank's risk function to oversee the delivery of HSBC's climate ambition and regulatory commitments. Before joining HSBC, she was a partner at Mazars, where she held a number of roles, including UK head of financial services consulting and lead partner for the UK climate risk practice. So right, without further ado, let's get on with our discussion. And Shona, you know, as someone who's at the sharp end of these issues as an audit committee chair, perhaps I'm best starting with you. And why don't we start with that very basic point? You know, tell me why you think ESG has become an issue that the audit committee specifically needs to get to grips with in one way or another. Well, um, as you said in your introduction, David, I think the audit committee has a, a, a natural remit over ESG matters. Uh, first of all, if you think um, it's uh, the oversight of the uh, system of risk management and internal controls and the assurance thereof. Um, and secondly, um, the integrity of reporting. Um, the audit committee often oversees um, the, uh, the, the statement that the financial uh, statements are, are fair, balanced and understandable. And I think you know, ESG plays a big part in that. 
Um, I would say, though, that I think the scope um, and the extent to which uh, the audit committee gets involved will vary a lot from organisation to organisation, depending what other committees there are, uh, depending on the nature of the business and how big these risks are in relation to the business. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hans, what about you? I mean, you're, you're an investor in a lot of these companies in one way or another, or an advisor to investors in, in these companies. Is, is this something you expect now to see? Do you expect to see audit committees grasping these issues in a way that maybe wasn't the expectation five, ten years ago? Yes, ab absolutely. I mean, I work for an investor, but I, as, as you said in the introduction, I'm also a lawyer. So for me, looking at the, the corporate governance structure of a company is effectively the board represents stakeholders, represents shareholders, um, and as Shona explained, is really the guardian of the financial statements, which are extraordinarily relevant for investment decision, for capital allocation. So that's one part, financial statements. And the other really important part is, is risk management, yeah. which is very closely related to um, ESG topics. So I, I think absolutely there, there should be a role for the audit committee um, overseeing ESG, and, and we much prefer this to be embedded in the audit committee and not create another committee ESG mm -hmm. that kind of sits sits at the side and uh, is, is doing this on the side because we think, and we will probably come back to this, we think really there are many ESG issues that are relevant both for the financial statements and also for the risk management function, and that's that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maud, what about you? Where, where, where does this sort of issue sit for you? What's your view on the Audit Committee's role? Well, I, I think both Shona and Hans Christoph touched on, on two important points. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the Audit Committee comes, you know, at the end of the risk assessment and management cycle. You identify your risk, you assess them, you, you manage them, and then you report on, on the, the whole cycle. And that's definitely the, uh, the remit of the Audit Committee. And, and it will really depend, as you said, Hans Christoph, about you know, the level of maturity of each firm and how many operating committees there might be, because some are you know, in very specific industries where you need specific you know, uh, expertise, and that might be the role of a sustainability committee, for example. But at the end of the day, you really need to ensure that there's a, a transversal approach to ESG risks management and that, at the end of the day, will always result, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the remit of, uh, of the audit committee. It, it has a very important role to make sure that the, the company doesn't operate in silos, sure. because that would be, uh, you know, very detrimental to, uh, to the company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Lena, from, a, from an HSBC perspective, I mean, either internally at HSBC or as, you know, a, a lender to, to so many companies and a financier of so many companies, what, what's your view on this? I think I would probably answer your, your question by focusing on one example of, of an ESG-related risk, uh, and that's greenwashing risk. So the risk of misleading, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly, your stakeholders in relation to your company strategy and uh, the green credentials or your green ESG performance, sorry or your products or the customers that, you, that your company works with, I think greenwashing risk should really get broad attention because it has the potential to manifest in multiple ways, including as reputational risk, um, but also in terms of lit litigation risk and potential fines from, from the regulators. In the UK also, the other thing I wanted to, to flag is the fact that um, directors in the UK, for instance, have a responsibility to sign off on TCFT disclosures, so climate-related disclosures. So clearly, that's also an area where uh, the audit committee is going to be expected to have the right skills and expertise to review these disclosures. And again, greenwashing is one of the issues that should be on their radars as they review these disclosures and sign them off. Uh, they need to, to have the skills and, and apply the right diligence to ensure that the processes underlying the disclosures are sufficiently robust. Mm -hmm. So clearly, I think my point here is greenwashing is a, is, is a complex area. Addressing it is going to require companies to, to build their internal capabilities at all levels, including at board levels with audit and, and risk committees. I mean, for, for us as a, as a financial institution, we have the two. We have an, an, audit, an audit and a risk committee as well. So we need to make sure that both committees have, those, um, have the, the remits and, and the right, uh, as I said, expertise and, and skills to, to, to look at these issues. 
I mean, it's really interesting that you pick, I mean, you, you sort of used that phrase expertise and skills several times in your answer, Leila, and, and a couple of the other panellists picked up on it. And, you know, this is a relatively new area for audit committees. Um, do do panellists feel that those skills exist? I mean, do audit committees have the skills and expertise to make some of these judgments in, in, in your view? Uh, I, I think, uh, look, I, I look at it like um, a, a, another potential specialist area. I mean, we had this a few years ago on IT. Uh, you know, d do you need an IT specialist mm -hmm. sitting on the board to, to actually manage the, the IT systems risk? Um, and there, there, there are other particular areas, um, you know, where... Um, and, and I think, it, again, it very much comes back to the company and, and its risks. Um, I think a lot, of, a, a lot of it, though, many companies will find they don't need specific right. expertise in ESG uh, sitting on the board. But I think um, all board members will need um, you know, to go up that learning curve on, on training. Yeah. You might want to buy in some uh, specialist expertise. Well, yeah. you mentioned that, you know, the importance of, of, of not ending up in silos. And I suppose the danger is when you think about skills in that sense, you have a board member for this, a board member for that, and exactly. none of them ever mm. talk. Mm. So, do, I mean, your view, I guess, would be everybody needs to have at least the skills to ask the questions. Well, you, you need to have at least a minimum understanding of, of what the key, uh, you know, mm. stakes are. You don't need necessarily to be an expert yourself in everything. That's impossible anyway, right? Mm. Uh, I think what is important, Sorry, what is important is to, to be sensitive to the fact that a new generation of risks are now you know, making their way into corporate reporting and, and, and business management. And, and you need to be savvy on how to navigate them and who mm. you need to turn to for, for appropriate answer and, and managing those, uh, those stakes. I don't think it's realistic to expect that uh, any board member or com yeah. audit committee member uh, should be an expert in, in everything. Yeah. Mm. But at least for the, for the critical things, I mean, we, we'll talk about climate later. I think I absolutely agree. I mean, you, you don't need a necessary climate scientist, although we're seeing that also that people are specifically put into board position for their climate background, but I think at least everyone on the board and f fully agreed needs to be climate literate because yeah. questions like net zero transition plan, they will be on the agenda and the board needs to be able to challenge uh, executives appropriately and speak to the specialist within the firm eye to eye. Um, so, so I think that there needs to be um, some, some upskilling. I think most board directors would, would acknowledge uh, that there are actually some um, organizations now forming that are specifically addressing the need for training for non-executive directors. And I think that's, that's really timely, really important. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah I can, I can, uh, sorry. I can, far away. I actually have a echo, so I wasn't sure if it was someone else who was trying to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was just going to say, that to, to Hans' point, I, I, precisely, we, we have, uh, I think it's happening across the financial industry, there's a lot of initiatives to train uh, board members on climate and ESG issues. And I think one, one of the, the, the reasons why this happened recently was actually driven by the regulator. So the Bank of England um, asked a number of financial institutions last year to, to run a climate stress test. And the result of the stress test had to be approved and signed off by the board. So clearly, board members <laughs> want, reasonably wanted to have a, a minimum level of understanding of what they were asked to, to sign off. So we, we actually had to do some work internally to, um, to train our board on, on, on those questions and to give them the skills to then challenge us. So that's, I think that's one example of, of initiatives happening where the board is raising actually their awareness and their understanding of something that can get quite technical. Um, but in, in this case, I think the, 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 the regulator um, drive was actually a, a positive thing in, in, in a broader sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. And you know, I mean, clearly that's an instance of where there's a regulatory imperative for, for boards and audit committees to seize the initiative and, and skill up, for want of a better phrase. More broadly, in, in those sectors which aren't directly regulated, do we think that audit committees are sort of stepping up in the same kind of way? I mean, Hans, you probably see more audit committees and, and more boards than, than the rest of us put together. Is it your impression that they're, they're, they're seizing the nettle on this issue? 
Well, I think particularly in the um, carbon emissions, uh, where carbon emissions are relevant, carbon exposure is large. I think there's an, there's an awareness that more needs to um, happen in terms of experience and expertise on the board. But clearly, if there's regulation, then it's in a, in yeah. a completely different, different, um, different league. Um, so, so I think it is happening, but there's still more to be done. Um, particular when you think about the relation of um, how does climate impact upon financial statements and then we're really back back to the topic what is the role of the audit yeah. committee and, and how much is already done and what auditors should be doing yeah. and um, I think there's there's much more work to be done yeah yeah I, I think they are st stepping up I, I have seen a distinct change over the last 12 months actually in in the the, the companies I'm involved in and um, I think it's for various reasons. Um, quite a lot of it um, is investors really pushing. Uh, investors want to know what companies are doing in relation to these uh, climate risks, um, in relation to uh, uh, emissions targets and, and so on, uh, particularly climate. Um, and I think some companies, depending on which sector they're in, can actually see opportunities. Mm in this, in helping their clients uh, become carbon neutral, particularly maybe engineering uh, firms or, or um, th those types of companies. So I see, a, I see a, a, um, a real momentum actually building, building behind this now. Um, and, I, I think, uh, and I think, Leila, that means we, we, I hope we will see less of the greenwashing <laughs> and m more of the actual real progress going forward. Um, and we will, we will need, though, more, uh, more uh, information, more targets, and more assurance, I think, around this whole area to get really comfortable with that, that, it, that it's built on firm foundations. More, does that, I mean, do, do you find clients ask about this? I mean, is this a... We, yeah, we, we actually get a lot of uh, more and more questions from uh, boards and audit committees on, you know, what's going on. We see, you know, things evolving in the same direction. How far is it going to go in terms of, you know, our level of responsibilities as board members? And there's an interesting, some people find it dreadful, initiative going on in, in Europe with, with a sustainable corporate governance directive mm -hmm. that was due back in June last year. And because it's so highly politically sensitive, it's been postponed to, you know, we're wasting, waiting yeah. for it. But, but that clearly says um, that the, um, the level of uh, skills from board members will, will would be, because mm. it still has to go through yeah. new approval and everything, but would actually be framed very specifically with direct links to uh, the actual material risks and impacts of any given entity. So we are moving towards a world where boards will have to demonstrate that they do have a clear understanding of what their risks and impacts are and yeah. they are doing the right thing to scale up not just the, the uh, operational uh, staff, but also uh, board members. So yes, we do see a lot of it. What I find interesting and very encouraging, it's not driven by fear, yes. because I think that would be going towards a tick the box uh, kind of um, behavior, and that's never you know, a good thing. It's, it's really sheer curiosity and, and a willingness to embrace uh, something that everyone understands is, is going to be the new normal. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, I, I think doing this properly um, is going to be part of your license to operate mm -hmm. actually going forward. It, you're just, it's going mm -hmm. to, you're going to have to do it properly. Yeah. Which brings you back to that point I think we made at the start about being grounded in risk and, yeah. you know, and, and that audit committee role there very specifically. Um, and just having that awareness, I guess, and, and, and seizing the opportunity is the point you made. Yeah. I, I guess I'm interested then in, you know, in, in how the audit committee plays a role in, in discharging some of these responsibilities and, uh, and executing on them. I mean, for example, I mean, reporting is a, a tricky area, um, whether we're talking about the, the sort of internal reporting within the organisation or indeed the external reporting. You know, um, we've got all of those kind of competing sets of standards out there in a way that we used to have with financial mm -hmm. reporting, I guess. We're now seeing that with ESG reporting. Um, 
uh, and you know, there is that question mark over which set of standards people should be using. I mean, I, I don't know whether people think, for example, that the new ISSB standards are going to be the default ones going forward, or whether people will still need to continue with the same um, uh, attention to the to kind of the European standards they've been uh, been focused on so far. What what are people's views? Who who wants to jump in first on that that external standards issue? Maybe I can start yeah, with being, you know, uh, with one foot on, on the audit side and the other one uh, on the standard setting side in, with, with EFRAG, who's currently, uh, you know, pushing the pen uh, for, for first uh, set of standards um, for Europe. Well, I think, you know, we, we tend to present the two initiatives as being competing initiatives, and I think that's not the right way to describe it, because they have a lot of things in common. Uh, it's just that one, the European initiative, uh, aims to go further, larger, and quicker. But at the end of the day, the starting point is, you know, financial uh, reporting and, and uh, financial mm -hmm. sustainability over the long term. And, and we tend to say that uh, the ISSB approach is that of the investor approach. So mainly driven by financial materiality. So what are the impacts of the external environment onto my ability to generate positive cash flow in, in the future? Um, which, which tends to, to imply that investors are not in, interested in impacts of the company on the, the outside world. And I think that, and hence, Christoph, you can contract me, contradict me if I'm wrong, but I think this is really changing investors do have an interest in, in the impacts on the outside world because at some point those negative impacts will come back in your face and hit your sure. ability to, uh, to, to, to uh, maintain sustainable uh, positive cash flow. So I think it's only a question of, of how far and how quickly those two initiatives will actually converge one important thing to have in mind, because I think this is really key, uh, is that right at the outset, they are compatible, right? It's just one has a smaller and more restrictive approach than the other. And, and um, I think it's going to, uh, to evolve uh, over time. Like at some point, I think under the pressure of, of uh, the investment uh, industry, um, the ISSB will have no choice but to embrace a larger view of, uh, of ESG. But do you think in, in the meantime, there's a sort of concern on audit committees that they're, they're dealing with a more burdensome reporting environment than they, they might otherwise have to deal with because they're thinking about, they may not be competing standards, but they're different standards nonetheless. It's, it's a fair concern. Um, it, it's uh, one that is on top of the uh, European Commission agenda because it's, it's an easy critic to uh, what they're trying to do. And I can tell you because that's number one on, on our list of criteria to draft the standards, whatever we produce has to be compatible with the ISSB approach so that any given international company won't have to produce two sets of different sustainability information, but you can use the same one to comply with two different uh, standards of framework. Easier said than done, I'll give you that, yeah. um, but, but clearly the direction of travel is that one. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you go, Hans. Yeah, maybe just that. I think it's really interesting, um, the uh, current trend, financial materiality, double mm -hmm. materiality in, in, in Europe. And I think we, uh, my, my opinion, haven't had quite a lot of exposure because our mothership is in, is in the US. Um, it remains to be seen how closely um, the two will grow together because it's very deep, deep, deep seated, the focus on materiality in much of the regulation in the US, but I completely agree there is a, there's a very significant mm -hmm. overlap um, between the two. And I, I think one doesn't even need to go all the way to double materiality. I, I think if, if I was on audit committee, I would think much more about uh, how's climate change relevant for the accounts. There was a really interesting story in, uh, not interesting survey in September um, last year, looking at um, more than 100 of the Climate Action 100 plus companies, so these are the highest carbon emitting uh, mm -hmm. companies in in the in the world. And, and the study, one of the key findings of the study was that more than 70 percent of the company, it isn't clear from the financial statements whether and how. 
climate, material climate related impacts were in incorporated. And, and I think that is, that is worrying, should really be the first concern for, for audit committees to ensure that they ex at least demonstrate what are the climate relevant factors for, for the company, how are they integrated, what are the estimates uh, and assumptions that are being made, looking at sensitivity analysis and also thinking about Paris alignment and that's comes back that's that's a tough tough ask and requires um, a lot of skill experience support from from advisors but um, it, just to say you don't need to go to double materiality space which is even more complicated yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that I think most audit committees certainly in the UK at the moment they're they're nowhere near thinking about international right. ac accounting reporting standards for ESG. They're grappling with TCFD <laughs> yeah. for the first time and just trying to, you know, trying to make a good fist of that first time through. So, yeah. So deal with it bit by bit. <laughs> yeah. Later, it looks as if that resonates with you. <laughs> no, no, actually, no, no, unfortunately not. I think at HSBC, we actually have to, to think about we we've had to work on TCFD for for much longer than you know even before the P, the FCA made it mandatory for listed companies in the UK. Uh, but it still it doesn't mean that it's it's easy. Uh, it's still a still a learning curve here. Uh, and I think the other challenge is we we, we mentioned ISSB versus the EU uh, directive. But you know when you think as about the, the taxonomy, the EU taxonomy and disclosure requirements, but also the other emerging taxonomies in other jurisdictions mm -hmm. for a multinational entity or company, it's 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 a lot of disclosure standards and frameworks to navigate. And what that means is, you know, the, the, the complexity of uh, making sure that you are reporting adequately in line of all these frame, with all these frameworks, but also the, the cost of doing that and the risk of having potentially inconsistent information across your set of disclosure. That's also something that audit and risk committees have to be on top of, right? So that's, that's an additional risk to, to, to manage. I just wanted to, to make, I mean, as I think as Maud says, we are definitely going to get to a convergence, po convergence point at some point, but we have to be <laughs> honest about the fact that today it's a, it's a difficult journey to navigate for, for companies. And it doesn't look like it's, not, it's, it's going to get worse until it gets better. Mm -hmm. mm. And Hans, I mean, leaving aside, leaving aside what the standards say, what, what do investors want to see? I mean, what, what, what do you think matters to investors and what should matter to them? Um, I think really important part is also to get get to know the audit committee to some degree. Um, so, so really understanding how they have so got got comfortable signing off as of financial accounts. How how they have they assessed the risk, uh, assess the risk management framework, and and then also I think more and more. And I think we will see a trend um, more interactions between investors and audit committees. Exactly to the questions we discussed earlier do the people on the audit committee actually really understand what they're doing? Can they challenge enough um, management or, or, or specialists? So that's, I think, a key, key that investors just need to know that the financial accounts reflect all material topics and climate is, is the number one concern. And, and I think the evidence at the moment is there's lots, lots of movement but probably we are, we are not quite where, where we should be in 2022. I mean, I'm, I'm also conscious that, you know, we, we've talked a bit about external disclosure and external reporting. I mean, that, that information doesn't just magically appear from somewhere. It's the product of an internal process. And I wonder to what extent, you know, audit committees are happy with the internal ESG reporting and disclosure um, structures they have within their businesses. Um, and, and the extent to which those those kind of structures are properly developed. I mean, mm. Shona, you might have a view on that. I, look, I think they're evolving and they're at different stages in, in, in different companies. I think um, a lot of companies for the first time this year will have had a stab at doing their scope one and scope two emissions. Um, some of them have, have you know, uh, made a stab <coughs> at those much harder um, scope three emissions so i think that's the first stage you know getting that getting that baseline actually understanding what em your emissions are and i think then the next stage is uh, setting those targets hopefully within a a, a net zero framework uh, you know 
20, uh, 2040, uh, 2035, 2040, 2050 net, net zero target and building the transition plan. Um, but I, I can certainly, uh, my experience is that, that most companies are, you know, starting with carbon emissions mm -hmm. um, and, and understanding that baseline. Um, and starting then to build uh, build targets against that baseline. And is this, I mean, is there a real role for the audit committee there in holding the business to account on its on its efforts to, you know, uh, look? I bring I, that? I think there is. Uh, I I think um, where there are uh, targets um, and certainly externally um, uh, externally exposed targets. Um, and there is measurement against those, I think there has to be some sort of assurance. Um, yeah. if, if they're really important things, I think there, there naturally has to be some sort of assurance around it, whether it's internal assurance or external assurance. And I think that falls within the remit of, of the audit committee. I mean, I, I see, um, it's very interesting because I think audit committees are evolving quickly now. I mean, if you look 10 years ago, they generally just dealt with financial risks. Mm. Really, they, they, they were, you know, it was the um, system of um, controls um, over financial risks that the audit committees focused on. And I think now, actually, it is that, you know, more and more they are and should be focusing on, on the, the total framework of risk management and controls, financial and non-financial. Mm -hmm. And obviously ESG sits in that sort of non-financial sure. bit. Um, I must say, I, I've, I've always wondered why audit committees never had a remit in the past over health and safety. I mean, health and safety is one of the big sort of S risks, particularly in a construction company or an extractive company or something else. It's a really big risk. It'll feature in major risks in, in uh, the report and accounts, but the audit committee sort of hasn't been involved at all mm. in, in, in mm. you know, the, the monitoring and assurance around that. And I think the role very clearly of the audit committee is, you know, um, it needs to ensure that there is that total framework of the three lines of defence, first, second and third line across all major risks. Uh, it's not operating all of those three lines, it's operating the third line, but it has oversight and it is providing a third line assurance, whether it's internal or external, over those major risks. So I, uh, I think we, we are seeing uh, the, the, the whole ESG agenda will, will uh, accelerate, I think, the development of what audit committees are doing, that wider remit over... Um, over all risks, all major risks, not just financial ones. Well, I think you make an interesting point on the health and safety point, because I mean, like, you know, understandably, given the environmental agenda and the, and the regulation in that area, yep. there's a lot of focus on E with companies, but maybe yep. less focus on S and G, for, you know, understandable reasons. Um, but I, I wonder more whether clients ask you about S and G and looking for help with with reporting on that as much as they do on the environmental stuff, for example? Not as much, because no. the pressure is definitely on, on, sure. on E and, mm. and within E on C, like climate. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's fast changing because I think, you know, and, and COVID uh, has uh, contributed to yeah. accelerating this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Suddenly people realize that S is a key success factor for your business, right? So we're starting, you know, looking at things differently. And it's the S brings you know extra difficulties because everything that is environment uh, related is more or less science based. You can measure, you can you know test it against uh, you know scenarios. I'm not saying scenarios are easy to put together, right? But your evidence is is science based. Completely different uh, you know world when you come to to S uh, for a number of reasons, right? You're talking about people, not assets. Um, and and uh, what might be good practice in one country or continent for cultural reason is going to be completely different, you know, in, in, another, in another region of the world. So how do you measure that? And, and so, you know, appreciating the, the good or bad, even though good or bad is not the right way of framing it, but 
it's actually you know raising a number of additional questions yeah. that go beyond just you know collecting the data and that part is already uh, you know super challenging already um, and, and that's part of what I see a lot of times you know with audit committees like they're very anxious about the quality of the sourcing of the data yeah. Yeah. the audit trail the robustness uh, mm -hmm. the relevance and, and we perf when we perform audit, it's oftentimes, even in, in large companies like HSBC and the likes, a lot is being run by, you know, using Excel spreadsheets with yeah. all of the uh, errors, you know, um, that it implies. So it's, it's really an area where, where collectively we need to make, you know, leap gap uh, jump in terms of uh, mastering the processes and, and the raw information. And on top of that, and that's not the least of uh, you know the the challenges. Just like the financial industry went through a revolution in the 1970s when we really started having uh, you know um, widely accepted uh, methodologies for financial analysis. Well, we are there today for extra financial uh, you know data and what you do of that, right? But you can't have a robust analysis that can be shared based on common methodologies if your raw data is, is not robust enough. So yes, we do get a yeah. lot of questions, including on S, because the challenge of data on S is even bigger than on E. Really interesting. Mm. I mean, Laila, you're- I was just going- Yeah, go, please go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just going to react to your, your question as well, David, on, on the, the, the balance between the focus on, on E versus S and G. I was going to say, obviously, I, I'm head of climate risk, so my focus is you know, daily, day in and, and out, I'm, I'm thinking climate. But even uh, the more, the deeper you think about climate, the more you start looking at the implications for the other dimensions of the ESG agenda as well. And I think one common term is the, the just transition agenda, right? So if, if we just want to transition to net zero at all costs, there are potentially easy or relatively easy ways to get there. Um, but I don't think it would be responsible for a company to do it without considering the impact on you know, communities and employees and the countries and the markets in which we operate. So that, that's where um, some of these social and, and, and governance related challenges actually interact with the climate and broader environmental agenda as well. And that, that needs to be taken into account when you're looking at climate risk. That's a really interesting point. So to come back to Moore's point, I mean, just as you don't want board members acting in silos, you probably don't want your E and your S and your G as, as different strands that never interlink. That, that, that there's, you need to be more holistic than that. Definitely. Yeah, mm. really interesting. Agreed. I also wanted to come back to one, one point about the we banned at some point the financial non-financial uh, terminology partly because if you look at if you look at, look at climate and uh, for example just look at the oil and gas sector once they start started really thinking what does net zero mean what, what does a pathway 1.5 degrees mean for a company what is the what are the oil price projections uh, and, and then you saw quite quite massive imp impairments write offs um, so I think for many ESG issues, the non-financial term is sometimes it is, it is not sort of 100 percent helpful and important that we identify what is the, the overlap between the material ESG financially relevant agenda. And then there are, of course, some topics where it's difficult to say how are they directly financially material for, for the company. Yeah. And I completely agree on, on the point that you need to look holistically at ESG. Okay, where does COVID come, come from? What are the reasons for, for COVID? How does COVID impact on different, uh, different parts of, of the society? And that's something really companies, but also investors need to start more yeah, holistically, I think is the word, to consider these in, in the context. But that, that potential sort of separation of financial and non-financial, I guess, is a really interesting one from an audit committee perspective, because that's where actually the audit committee is probably very well placed to, you know, see the nettle and say, no, actually, your non-financial absolutely is financial, frankly. It um, is over time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a, a non-financial risk, it's just a matter of time exactly. till it becomes a financial yeah. risk. <laughs> so it's really just the time frame, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, in engagement, too, and the extent to which boards are talking to their investors to, and to other groups of stakeholders, for that matter, about, um, about ESG issues. Now, you know, I know those conversations are going on, I'm conscious that we're talking about audit committees today. 
Do people think that audit committees should be involved in that conversation? You know, should someone on the audit committee be involved in those discussions with shareholders or, or, or indeed other stakeholder groups? Um, Hans, I mean, mm. you, you spend a lot of time in engagement meetings, I assume. Um, when you're having ESG discussions, do they typically involve people with the audit committee? I'm guessing that would be the exception rather than the norm at the moment, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think it depends very much. So we, we are a very global team. We engage with companies in Japan, US, Germany, UK, um, and it just varies. Even the access to the board as such is very different in, in different uh, jurisdictions. I think here in the UK, we have the, we can almost pick who do we want to see and, and then it's more about um, sometimes audit chairs, they are very willing here, at least for the, for the largest companies in, in the UK. And it is probably from having done this now for 18 years, almost, it, it, it is probably one, one of the channels that hasn't been used enough, particularly if you think about coming back to, come, come back to climate and yeah. how does climate impact upon the financial um, accounts. So we, we, we are using um, the tool on, on occasions where sometimes where things have gone wrong, but increasingly also over the last couple of years um, to, to saying um, what investors call Paris aligned accounts, which also also includes, of course, the auditor has a, has a role. Um, and, and I think there's a massive, massive trend amongst the investors to look at this more, more carefully. So I would expect at least for the countries where it is possible from, from a legal perspective, governance perspective, that these conversations will pick up. And if, if they're not satisfactory, that investors will also go um, and, and look at the shareholder meeting agenda, look at, look at the accounts, can we approve them, um, look at the auditor appointment, and also look at audit committee uh, members if the discussions are not, not proceeding in a way. So I think it's really in its in infancy, but I would predict that it's, it will pick up in a massive way over the next few years. What about the audit committees you serve on, Shona, and chair in some cases? I mean, do they, do they have a role in engagement? Um, generally not. Um, my, my experience of engagement with investors is, is that it's almost exclusively um, the, the, the chairman and, right. and maybe the CID, um, the senior independent director, who, who interact, with, um, interact with investors. Um, that's not to say that if an investor, you know, wanted to talk to the audit committee chair, you know, we'd be around there like a shop. But we're generally, generally not asked. H having said that, in you know, w w uh, the, the the couple of companies where I'm chairman, investors always want to talk about the ESG right. agenda, mm. and we probably spend half our time talking about the ESG agenda, um, uh, assuming, assuming the results are okay, that is. Um, you know, actually, they're, they're very interested in the ESG agenda. So, um, but it's generally not the audit committee uh, chair that is, is having those discussions. It's, it's the chairman and, and uh, the chief. But you're executive. saying that's not for want of audit committee no, being prepared to talk about it. It's just not the request it's that you're getting not, at the moment. It's just not, you're not getting a pull there. You're mm -hmm. certainly yeah. not getting a pull there from investors. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. More, I mean, clients wise, I mean, did, did similar kind of feeling for you? Or? Well, what we do look at when we uh, review sustainability information is is the governance of stake around stakeholders uh, engagement right not just investors like the the, the whole scope of stakeholders uh, so so what we see is that there is very little actual engagement between the audit committee and and the wider stakeholders I mean beyond just investors yeah they but what they do look at and challenge are the processes uh, and the results of, of actual uh, stakeholders' engagement by those departments that are in charge of this, and they will challenge the results. And when the results are, the results are not where they expect to be, then they, they may request to actually uh, meet with certain uh, category of stakeholders just yeah. to clarify you know, um, the feedback that has been given, uh, w whether it's good, it's good or bad, right? Mm. But it's, it's, 
more in reaction okay. to uh, the results of uh, the actual uh, engagement by, by a different department rather than, you know, a systematic uh, mm. uh, press the button, uh, you know, now is time in the year where the audit committee is going to, uh, to, to meet and engage with stakeholders. But, but, but I tend to agree, it might, it might actually change because the pressure from a number of categories of stakeholders is going to rise and, and they might want to turn to the audit committee to make mm -hmm. sure that the internal quality controls and systems and, and risk management are in place and well managed uh, to, to make sure that the relevant risks for each one of the categories of stakeholders are well covered. Mm. Yeah, and that's an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, clearly, as the sort of scope of the audit committee's work on ESG expands, there is, you know, there's a greater surface area, if you like, to, to, to talk to stakeholder groups. And other stakeholder groups are interesting, actually. I mean, you know, we often fall into the trap of just talking about shareholders and investors. But, you know, clearly, there are plenty of people out there. Um, NGOs being uh, the most demanding one, and mm. they, they're really not shy about, you know, knocking on yeah. the right doors to, to uh, get things moving up the agenda, up to mm. the board. Mm. Uh, so I, I think, yes, a, a number of companies, especially those with large supply chains in, in certain geographies, uh, will face that more and more, I yeah. expect. Later, I mean, the, the kind of work that you do, I mean, with a climate risk hat on, I mean, that must bring you into contact with quite a broad range of stakeholder groups, I, I guess. And, you know, do you see them pushing for, for more engagement with, with the board, with, with audit committees, with, um, you know, with the business more generally? I mean, either, either HSBC itself or, or the companies that you work with? Yeah, I think definitely. There is definitely uh, a, a lot. And I think the demand is increasing for that, that kind of engagement with stakeholders, um, external stakeholders. I, I also wanted to say, I think even internally, we are, I am actually seeing a, a lot of, of, of requests from board audit and risk committees for engagement with the management on these questions. So it's clearly a topic of interest for the audit, 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 audit committee and for the risk committee as well. So I, I mean, if, if investors wanted to, to speak to these committee members, they would definitely be well informed to have th these discussions, given the amount of engagement we have internally with them. Um, so that's 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 something I, I wanted to to touch on. Um, and to your your question about whether the, the the sorry, what was your question again, David? Well, I think I was coming back to this point. You know, you've got a climate risk hat on, particularly at HSBC, and I, you know, that seems to be an area where we know there are a lot of active NGOs in particular, but it's also an area where employees are very concerned. I mean, there are countless groups with a with a stake in the game on on, on climate, and quite rightly so. So. I'm just interested in the extent to which you're seeing from that side those groups kind of stepping up their engagement activities and you know, the extent to which businesses like HSBC but but also the businesses you lend to and, and work with um, uh, you know, are, are prepared to engage with that. Yeah, I think we have to engage with those with those groups, including NGOs, as you say. And actually, we're finding it very constructive. I mean, it, it helps us inform our approach to even risk assessment, you know, for certain uh, companies which are exposed to climate risk, having these external perspectives is, is definitely valuable. So we are having this engagement. I think the amount of resources that are dedicated to engaging with these groups is also increasing internally. Um, and, and, and I think when you look at the last AGM, or also the last HSBC AGM, the amount of questions we had on climate, I think, is, is a clear indicator of the, the interest that you know, stakeholders, shareholders have on, on climate and, and ESG-related issues. So I think boards broadly need to be engaged to, to, um, to be prepared to engage constructively with, with stakeholders. And as I said, I think we're actually finding it really valuable to get that, those perspectives to inform our, our, our own approaches to ESG risk management yeah that's really interesting mm -hmm. um I, I was also going to ask people about sort of you know the potential for confrontation and the extent to which audit committees then start to get worried about these kind of issues i did i saw i can't remember exactly what the stat was but there was a stat i saw the other day about the number of shareholder resolutions to agms last year and how esg issues had sort of shot to the top of the list of issues that resolutions are coming in on so there clearly is you know an appetite to to take corporates on on some of these issues and that We've seen lots of instances where that's got people into difficult situations with their shareholders. You know, does that that's you know, does that then sort of loom large on the risk radar of audit committees? That that idea of investors threatening to take their money elsewhere, or 
banks saying, well, we're not prepared to lend to businesses with these kind of exposures anymore. Um, you know, is there a worry from that perspective, do you think? So I think it, it, at the moment it depends what you, um, what you mean by confrontational it, it, exactly, but I, I would think the, uh, the audit committee from everything I'm picking up, even over the last, last few weeks from investors, um, there's certainly a, a great focus on accounts and on audit committee members yeah. um, and this will be reflected over time. Some investors are already saying if, if you don't see progress then we will use our shares primarily. That's, that's really normally the first step, direct election, accounts, um, auditors. I think that divestment is always sort of a, a very last resort and there need to be many other reasons to be in, in, in that camp. But um, investors will certainly use the, um, yeah, the, the, the techniques, the tools they have because also that's our responsibility for our beneficiaries. We, we, we need to ensure that companies are doing their jobs, that boards are doing um, their, their, uh, their jobs. So that's the, the, the confrontation, if you like. I yeah. don't think okay. confrontation is, is yeah. normal exercise of, of rights, which includes sometimes shareholder resolutions, um, but then just using the voting rights. Yeah. And typically, I mean, I, we certainly don't have meetings where it gets very heated in, in, in meetings. And sometimes you agree to disagree. Um, and, and then you talk again, and continue talking, but there's also an escalation pro process, of course, on, from our side. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would just say, I think, um, you know, where you have a, a, an activist investor or an NGO or, you know, someone, some stakeholder who's saying you're getting it wrong, we, we think you're getting it wrong, I think, you know, uh, I think the right thing to do is to lean into those, you know, lean into those situations. Invariably, there's something to learn, you know. Even if, if, if you know, part of what they're saying you fundamentally disagree <laughs> with, there's usually something there to learn and 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 take away. So I think you've just got to lean into those situations. That's yeah. a very diplomatic way of putting it. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I do believe that there's usually usually something there you know um if looking at it through their lens you know the the, the way they yeah. look at it no i take the point i mean to your point hans my background is as a journalist so i always enjoy the confrontations <laughs> i don't want you to have reasonable conversations and constructive dialogues with one another that's let yeah, that's we call them constructive dialogue no, no not confrontation <laughs> exactly exactly no you could remain cordial and polite well indeed I indeed <laughs> well, i mean what, one area i was going to ask about and I, I think this will lead us on um we, we mentioned assurance earlier on, and we'll come on to talk about that in a moment. But, you know, there is that concern there about greenwashing. And I wonder whether audit committees are getting questions from shareholders and indeed from other groups about the quality of reporting, to come back to what we were talking about a minute or so ago. You know, are you getting investors or, or any other parties coming forward and saying, look, frankly, we just don't think these numbers hold water. Um, you know, we, we, we don't believe them. We're not, we, we think the wool is being pulled over people's eyes here. Because clearly that would be a real concern for the audit committee and somewhere where they would feel that they'd have to intervene. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, have we seen examples of that? Maud, I mean, do you... Do no, you... personally, I haven't. Um, the, the threat uh, usually comes from internal sources before you're being hit by, you know, uh, right. external questions, um, you know, using different, different channels. So I personally haven't experienced that, but I know it has happened uh, you know, in a number of companies. At the end of the day, what is really challenged when, when you're accused of greenwashing is, is mostly to raise your attention to the fact that you're providing a lot of information on something that is completely immaterial or irrelevant uh, to your business. And, and that you're remaining completely silent on what is actually the elephant right. in the corridor, right? This is what greenwashing mm. is about. Mm. And I think it's always a good thing to, as, as uh, Shona said, like lean in because you might have overlooked something that is a major threat to your business. And, and even though, you know, has, as, uh, you know, uncomfortable a conversation that might be, there might be some good, uh, you know, uh, intake of information in there to reconsider your risk assessment. And, and at the end of the day, the, the, the reporting part will be the easiest part, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about telling the story, but if you have missed, 
uh, a major impact or risk, then, then you're in a very different situation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So that does come back to the audit committee and its ability it to, you know, tell that story and tell, well, a tell the right story and and, and b so, tell it. So what I've seen regularly, it comes through the investor relations department, mm. and then it goes through the financial uh, department, and and next thing you know, it's on the table of the uh, audit committee. But that's that have seen that's quite a number of times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do think this, this comes back, though, uh, in relation to financial statements. And, of course, there are many other mechanisms through which you can greenwash. Yep. It's not just the financial statements. Mm -hmm. It's your marketing, your advertising, sure. the whole range of, mm -hmm. of, of other things that you can use to greenwash. Um, and that, again, comes back to the role of the audit committee. It does tend to f focus on the, you know, the annual report and accounts and the interim statements. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if, we're, if the audit committee is there to, to be happy that the financial statements are fair, balanced and understandable, that doesn't go with greenwashing, no, sure. basically. <laughs> Full stop. So, you so know. are we saying that, you know, you know if companies start to, to fall prey to accusations of greenwashing, then maybe the audit committee hasn't done its job in the first place? Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Although, as I say, there are lots of ways that a company can go about greenwashing yeah. other than through the... the um, you know, annual report and accounts and, and financial statements. Yeah. 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 And, and the survey I mentioned earlier uh, is um, is really a report looking at an independent report, not 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 from us, looking at how companies incorporate climate-related risk in their financial statements. So this is not the report's not called here's big greenwashing, but the report certainly says we cannot see the evidence that you're doing this in a meaningful way. We as investors can can understand and, and, and robustly challenge. So there's certainly a a challenge of, of, of better disclosure. Yep. But if that doesn't get better, then uh, I think it will soon be in an area where there will uh, people will get qu quite vocal about it. Um, and I think both audit committees and auditors need to really get 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 on the case. And I think, well, I think that whole sort of trust issue brings us on quite nicely, actually, to the topic of assurance, which we, mm -hmm. we've touched on a couple of times during this debate. So, you know, I mean, I, th I mean, first of all, I think it'd be interesting to know where we're at with assurance on on on, um, uh, on ESG work, the extent to which assurance services are actually available and, and useful and valuable out there, um, and then we, you know. If they are available, to what extent people are availing themselves of those services, um, you know, in order to, to stand behind their accounts um, and their reporting more robustly. Mm. Um, I mean, like, like, tell us about HSBC. I mean, do, what, what kind of assurance do you guys? What kind of assurance work do you guys do internally, um, or, or indeed, do you use external assurance um, services? Um, probably fair to ask you about climate numbers in particular, rather than the other aspects of, of, of ESG. Yeah, we do both. I mean, we have a, obviously have an internal assurance framework on on this uh, on this info on climate related information, and our auditors also provide limited assurance on, on some parts of the of the report. Um, I just wanted to. I think we need to be realistic on this as well, right? This is really complex, and we have to acknowledge the fact that companies are, are having to deal with imperfect data i think Maud called it out earlier the data out there is imperfect and in some cases it just doesn't exist i mean for a bank like hsbc mm. one key piece of information is how are our customers going to transition to net zero because we want to base our risk assessments on the fact that this customer is better prepared prepared to transition compared to another today the information just doesn't exist in most cases because these companies themselves don't know how they are going to transition to net zero. So we are being asked to make an assessment based on data that doesn't exist, or when it when it exists, it's the quality is probably just not where it should be. So I think even if you know we can have these assurance uh, processes in place around this all of this, but we have to accept the fact that it's it's going to be. 
um, limited. It, it's going to be a journey until we get to the point where we are we are honestly going to be comfortable with the with this information and you know with the the kind of detail, the level of detail that we need, the robustness of the information that we we want to use, the controls underlying the data, the the methodologies to assess that data and to get to the right decision. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So it's an imperfect world then, but that doesn't mean that you know, investors and other groups aren't going to try and hold organizations to account on this stuff. And um, uh, so, so I hear what you're saying. I mean, what, what about clients? Are they looking for What kind of assurance work are they looking for um, when they talk to you about sustainability? And It really uh, depends who right. is, is asking for assurance. Um, if, yep. if it's, um, you know, in investment firms driven, um, th then we'll have a specific uh, approach to, uh, you know, m more process uh, oriented uh, rather than the raw uh, data and the coherence of, of uh, you know, the link between the set targets, the identified risks for set targets and how you, uh, you know, you manage uh, those targets. But, but the reality is that, I mean, we are all struggling with assurance, uh, you know, today, uh, I including auditors first. For, for a number of reasons. One, there is no universal standard for assurance right. of sustainability information. Yeah, so you, you go from one country to another and you'll have a different way of looking at sustainability information. You can't compare a report that is being issued by a French auditor versus a German auditor. Two different ways of looking at things. So it's an end. We're all struggling with, you know, the, the quality of the raw data and unless and until we have real forceful uh, reporting standards uh, that are as universal as, as possible, we'll be comparing apple and oranges, right? So a number of really structural things have to, uh, you know, uh, really crystallize soon so that we, we, we have standards to audit against, right? Otherwise, it's just my opinion versus somebody else's opinion, and I'm not sure you know, how relevant and useful it is for, for investors and any other stakeholder. So in that context, unless a company is legally obliged mm. to, to uh, have uh, its information assured, a lot of them just pass because, because it's costly. And at the end of the day, it's not serving the, uh, the needs of the users. Yeah. And I think that is really something that needs to change uh, rather quickly mm. and, and, and very profoundly. What do you think, Hans? I mean, are you, are you impressed when companies have done assurance work? Or to, to, to more to point, do you just think, well, actually, this isn't particularly useful to me because I don't know what that assurance actually means in the context of what Maud's just said? I mean, you know, is assurance a kind of criteria that you, that you look at when you're, when you're making judgments about businesses and their, and their ESG performance? Yeah, what was interesting to hear, uh, Le Leila and Maud speaking about, it, it, that's a real question because the, the standards are so, so different, the, the data is, uh, is insufficient um, often, but of, of course whenever you have any type of assurance it makes you at least feel a little bit better, yeah. uh, but then you, you still very often see cases where Maybe um, not after what Maud's just said. Uh, yeah. Maybe you'll be re I'm, I'm, I'm not doing justice to my profession, <laughs> exactly. but it's, it's, it's yeah. uh, a honest answer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But it, it certainly, I, I would think that it impacts particularly on um, sort of the box ticking ESG research um, agencies that they sometimes just have a list and they require certain, right. uh, a certain assurance to have happened on specific parts of um, ESG, of the ESG agenda so that it would help companies and that you probably cannot get away and get a reasonable rating. But we would always go much, much, much deeper and not just rely on the research we, we, we can buy, but then do our own due diligence and, and also test, test on the ground what's actually happening. So when you see a business's ESG reporting signed off by an external assurer in one way or another, that doesn't sort of raise your confidence. You still feel that you need to go away and do your, do your own work and you know, test those things for yourselves. It's, it's only starting point. Yeah. yeah. If you do, you, you need to go deeper than um, a, a research report and a, and a limited assurance on, on some of the things. Yeah. I think we need to be informed here by, you know, where we've got to 
uh, in terms of quality and scope and financial audits. Now there we've mm. got very clear standards. Yes. Mm. We've got to actually, despite the one or two failures, very high quality. And the reason that we have those audits is so that so that um, investors principally can rely on the financial mm. statements to mm. make investment decisions. And I see uh, particularly climate um, data as becoming just as relevant for financial investors for making investment decisions. And therefore, I think the whole audit, uh, the auditing profession, the standard setting, uh, the quality of audits um, in this area is going to progress very quickly. I think because it has to, and I think in, in the investment markets will demand it. So um, at, the, at the moment, it's right at the beginning, really. As we said, there are no, there are no co uh, coherent standards there. Um, a lot of the assurance out there on non-financial matters is negative assurance. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's not, it's not um, positive assurance in any way. Um, and the providers, um, uh, you know, I think there are probably some very good providers out there, but also, you know, it's not a, it's not a profession like, uh, like you know, uh, the auditing, pro the financial auditing profession at the moment. So, I mean, yeah. does that mean, not to put you on the spot, but does that mean for the boards you sit on, you know, when this topic of assurance comes up, I mean, is, is it your view? Would you say to your board colleagues, Look, to be frank, I don't really feel this is worth paying for at the moment. It's, you know, it's not of a good enough quality. And to be, uh, the no, other things, look, it's not uh, going to... again, it just depends where right. you've got to in this journey. In, in, uh, in, uh, I think I'm just trying to remember a couple of my companies. We do have our emissions, you know, right. uh, mm -hmm. our, our emissions data audited. And actually, it's audited by our financial auditor. So I think we're quite happy. We're quite happy with that. We sort of understand what's going on and um, the standards against which is assured. And we do, we do see value in that. Um, you know, it's helped us actually build those, those baselines, you know, getting that data audited. Um, but I think the, the, uh, the audit of... Um, emissions and other related topics, I, I think it has a long way to go, both in terms of standards and in both of, uh, and providers, providers of, 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 of the audit. And that presumably means the assurance of social and governance factors, there's even further to Potentially, go. If, if you need them assured, as right. I say, it all depends how big the risk is and, and uh, you know, what do, what do our stakeholders need and want? Uh, you know, and there's a, as a com I come back to financial statements, there's a very r real need why those need to be audited. Yeah. People need to know the numbers are right, you know, to make investments. Yeah. But I think we'll, we'll get to that stage, particically with uh, climate, uh, climate uh, related reporting. I mean, yeah. in Europe, it, it, it's, it's not even a question, right? The, the, uh, the draft uh, corporate uh, sustainability reporting directive makes it mandatory yeah. to have the mm. entirety of your ESNG information being assured, right? Mm. But it also requires... By an external provider. Exactly. Yeah. Using, you know, the, the soon-to-be-born uh, to uh, European sustainability reporting standards and, and in addition, it's, it's embedded in actual, actually in the uh, CSRD draft that Europe needs to define together with international um, audit and assurance standard boards the, the approach to uh, delivering the uh, assurance services, right? So it's, it's a clear acknowledgement that, that we need some sort of, uh, you know, uh, review and assurance on all that information, mm. but we just don't have the appropriate tool today. Mm. And, and you will even find provisions about the level of skills to be expected from the auditors themselves, right? Mm. Um, because we all acknowledge that, uh, you know, it's, it's somehow a, a new set of skills that we need to build. Um, there's a lot of debates between should it be done by the financial auditors or a separate team. Our approach in Mazar is, is uh, and, and that uh, was my vision uh, right at the outset, I told the executive committee, we need to have the financial auditors onboarded on those new risks day yeah. one. I, I want every financial auditor to be savvy enough to understand what will be the consequences of ESG risks 
on financial statements to begin right. with, right? Yeah. Let's not wait for, for the, the rest of our assurance services to be mature enough to onboard our financial auditors. I think that's the direction of travel, right? Uh, how long it's going to take before financial auditors actually are, you know, they, they will never be sustainability experts, but they are going to be comfortable enough with, with the interaction between risks and impacts and financial, uh, you know, literacy, uh, that it's going to anyway contaminate the way we perform financial audits to start with, right? But, but we need to build the skills, we need to build the tools, uh, and, and, and it's not for tomorrow, it's for yesterday, right? Mm. So mm. we're getting there, it's mm. just we, we, we need I mean, to build more. It's a really interesting point. I mean, there's a couple of things that strike me about what you've just said. I mean, firstly, it sounds as if the world, you know, what the assurance industry is going to have difficulty complying with that regulation if it comes in quickly i mean that sounds like we're going to have to train a lot of people very yeah. fast definitely yeah. yes yeah. absolutely i mean we're facing the same skill challenge uh, our clients are facing let's let i mean and, and i don't think it would be honest to uh, to say otherwise we we mm. the, the entire industry in this is yeah. in this position I mean, the other thing that struck me about it is that it's a regulatory imperative pushing it rather yeah. than investors, for example, to your point, Hans, demanding it. I mean, it sounds to me as if investors are saying, and particularly the ones that are switched on and very focused on these issues, do you know what? We're doing our own work here. You know, we're, we're effectively performing an assurance operation mm -hmm. of our own as part of our, our duties. So maybe it's less important to people like you. We also actually need, um, it's interesting, the European approach that they have first focused on the investors. So investors also need to report to their clients, uh, to mm -hmm. asset owners. So we're desperately waiting for the data that will come up yep. the chain from, from, from companies. So I, I, all, all of this to say there is clearly um, a lot of interest from the beneficiaries, uh, pension funds we, we represent. And, and that this way it gets, gets, gets up the chain. But the, the system is yeah, not far from perfect at the moment. And from all I'm reading um, in, in the media, but there's a massive recruitment drive um, of the audit uh, firm, consultancy firms, and, and, uh, and I think this is an area that will grow and get, get more sophisticated, but I like the approach that you don't separate it from, yeah. from, from the mainstream uh, f financial auditing, because ultimately it's so important that it goes hand in hand. Which I think brings you back all the way to that point, Shoni, mm -hmm. you made an hour or so ago about this you know, delineation between financial and non-financial yeah. actually yeah. being a bit meaningless yeah. and the two going think, hand in I hand. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Listen, I think that's a good place to pause for a moment. I promised at the start of this um, uh, discussion that we'd also take some questions from the audience, and I know that people have been feeding those through. Um, so what I want to do is just um, have a look at a few of those before we, uh, before we finish up in 15 minutes or so. Um, I've got them in the screen in front of me. I'm hoping my eyesight's up to reading them from here, but mm -hmm. I, think, I think we're fine. So I think this is probably a question. I mean, this might be a question for you in the first instance, um, Hans, but we can see what other people too think. So... Our question has said, you know, it said that ESG has until recently been left largely to governance departments, institutional investors. Are fund managers themselves now becoming fully engaged and getting involved with their governance teams on ESG issues? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, great, great, great question. I, I think it's uh, absolutely right. Certainly when I started 18 years ago, this was a fair description of what, what, what happened, but now I think everyone is, is engaged and you just need to read, um, just read, need, need to read the media. Everyone's involved, every um, fund manager says they are, um, they are green, they're integrating ESG, um, they have sustainable um, products. And, um, and I think the, the two things are a little bit similar to what we discussed about in terms of the auditing. The specialists work much more closely together mm -hmm with the fund managers and there's also a new generation of, of fund managers who are who can do everything, who can do properly understand ESG but are also trained to be fund managers and that's I think the, the, the sweet spot where we ultimately want to be that the two grow together and ESG is just another um, factor you consider when, when you invest um, and, and, and once you are an investor. Well, I guess if you look at the growth of the, the ESG market in the asset management world you know, every asset manager claims to be an ESG expert these days. I haven't seen a fund launch that didn't have an ESG angle <laughs> for, one, for one form or another. So presumably they're able to practice what they preach. Plus, of, of course, also the, the danger. <laughs> I talked about greenwashing on... It cuts on, both ways, on, yeah. On, on, on corporates and, and some, I think some of the asset managers are already experiencing um, a little bit of, of that feeling that one really needs to deliver what one 
promises on the on, on the tin. And that will be, I think, a real challenge. And therefore, if you look at the regulation that has come in for investors, um, SFDR, it's, it's called for, for us, um, it, there are requirements where you need to be really specific yeah. about labeling your funds and then delivering. Is it an ESG integration? Is there a sustainable impact? Or is it something that is trying to change, change the real world um, apart from the, from the financial impact? So I think actually here some some regulation is is helpful for those that are doing it. Yeah, and actually I mean that asset manager um, focus on, on on ESG driven by things like SFDR must actually be pushing them down the direction of asking for this kind of detail. I mean that's the other yeah. push that we're seeing regulatory wise, isn't it? You know, um, institutional investors want this information because they have to declare it themselves increasingly mm. under SF, SFDR. Yeah. The, the change I've noticed is that uh, five years ago, you went along to see the, uh, as, as the chairman or whoever, you went along to see the fund manager and the governance people separately. Now you go and they're all together, which is much, much better. Mm. You know, you're having the conversation yeah, yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So that's the change I've noticed, cool. which is good. Yeah, how it should be. Yeah. Um, and we've got a question which uh, sort of takes us back a little bit to our um, our assurance conversation. But I mean, it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, so this panel, th th this question is curious to know about people's views on the role of internal audit in providing assurance. We talked a lot actually about external firms and what what they might do, and maybe we skated over um, the role of internal audit in providing assurance to audit committees. Um, can, I, can I say? Of course you can. About yeah, that. Yeah, I'm. I'm um, I think internal audit have a, a really important role here. Remember, internal audit are the third line of defence. So they may well not be experts in e, e, S, or G, but where they should be is ensuring that there is a framework of, of risk management, control and assurance, an appropriate <coughs> framework in place in relation to these risks. They may not be providing that third line assurance. They, they, they may well not have the expertise. And you see the same thing in IT audits. Often your internal auditor would not be providing the actual assurance mm. there. They'd have to, someone would have to come in and do that. But I think they have a, a great role to play in, in ensuring that total assurance risk and control framework is in place in relation to these risks. Well, do you have a view on that? I mean, are you saying clients? I entirely concur with that. Uh, I think it's a central piece of a robust approach to, uh, you know, managing your risks. Mm. Um, you, you, you can't have, a, you know, a, the level of uh, comfort you need without uh, having your internal audit team being, uh, being involved. It, otherwise, you would be treating uh, ESG risks differently from, exactly. from yeah. everything exactly. else. It just doesn't make sense, right? It's, yeah. it's, I think it's common sense that they have to be part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Leila, I don't know if there's an HSBC perspective on that. I mean, you, you talked about the assurance work um, that goes on there, particularly on the, on, on the climate side. Is there an internal audit um, focus on, on, on ESG? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I completely agree with what more than and Shona said there. It's 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 one of one of our key risks, right? So we we have to manage it in line with our risk management framework and and the role of internal audit as a third line of, of defense there is is major. So really, you know, looking at how the business lines are integrating this ESG consideration in their strategy, how they go to market, how the risk function is is managing those risks uh, as a second line. And um, so really across the board, uh, the, the role of internal audit is, is major, and we are seeing them becoming more and more active on, on these issues. Yeah, OK, really interesting. And there's another question come in. Again, I think this might be a good one for you to start with, Leila. So th this question is saying, look, Net zero transition plans, obviously hear lots of news about them, very topical, lots of discussion about what a good transition plan looks like. Is that something a, a, a risk committee or an audit committee should be looking at? Um, is that, you know, would, would the, would the organisation's net zero transition plan be a priority for the audit committee in your view? Yeah, I mean, one, it's, it, I think it has to be a priority because it's, it's actually the way um, organisations are going to be able to manage this climate related risk. If you don't have a net zero transition plan, then clearly it means that you're not prepared to, to manage this, what I think is a, is, is a massive and, and systemic risk today. 
Um, but also, I think if you consider, for instance, here in the UK, the, the Chancellor announced that at COP26 that transition plans were becoming a requirement for a certain number of companies. So it's also going to become a disclosure requirement. And I think that's that's also where the audit committee is going to have an interest here. So clearly, I think I think it's an urgent issue that, uh, that audit and, and risk committees should start getting on, on top of. Uh, you know, making sure that they have robust strategies in place uh, to, to, to manage that transition to reduce emissions in line with the net zero pathway, uh, and also engaging with customers uh, and investees for, for investor invest, in investment companies on their transition planning. Um, and, and I think ultimately, I mean, the positive is it's going to help drive emissions uh, reduction in the, in the real economy, which is, I think is, is a good thing for everyone. Mm -hmm. Shona, you sit on the board of, um, of EVA. I know you're a relatively newcomer Very to that new. board, but um, <laughs> I know they've recently announced, announced a net zero plan. I think it was 2040, is that their? 2040. 2040 right. is, their, is their net zero committee. So, yep. you know, was that a plan, and without asking you to, to share any sort of confidential information, but was that a plan that was signed off by the audit committee or which the audit committee has looked at? So Look, I, I, I don't know is the answer. I wasn't around at that stage. Um, I am absolutely uh, sure, though, that it was considered at the highest levels. And, and indeed, the work now is to put, you know, I, I flesh on the bones, I suppose, um, I would say, to, to really build that transition plan in detail. Mm, mm. And, you know, I see some companies saying, oh, well, you know, we'll say 2050 because that's about the furthest we can <laughs> say. But I think you've just got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to sort of stick, stick your stake in the sand here, really. And you might not quite know how you're going to get there, but you've actually got to be a bit brave mm. And, you know, stick a stake in the sand and start working towards it. And I would, I would urge every company to be ambitious uh, in, in these um, uh, net zero uh, transition plans. Yeah. Well, just uh, there's a question here which I think maybe speaks to that ambition. So, and I think this question sort of takes two forms, really. But the question is saying, you know, we've, we've talked about how companies need to improve ESG performance and importing, uh, reporting. Is this going to be very expensive for some businesses, substantially reducing their profits? So I think there's two bits there, isn't there? I mean, there's the, the net zero plan itself. Is that hugely expensive? And clearly the answer depends which industry you're in. Yeah. But, you know, I think more germane to the conversation we've just had over the last hour or so, what kind of burden are we talking about for, for businesses in terms of doing all of this extra audit work, all this extra reporting work, all this disclosure? Is it a substantial burden? Um, Maud, you might be a good person to take a first stab <laughs> at that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I can't say that reporting is not a burden, uh, especially because a lot of uh, you know, data sourcing is manual. Uh, it takes really a lot of hours. Um, we, we, we'll have to invest in systems to secure the information. So I, I think definitely it's, it's not f for free, right? But I think the cost of not looking into yeah. the risks to right. your business strategy is incomparably higher. Um, the cost of reporting in comparison is ridiculously low, right? So I think this is the way to approach it. It's not so much how much reporting is going to cost to me, it's what are the, the real risks to my business, but also the opportunities. Because yeah. when change yeah. comes, it means that something that wouldn't have had a chance to fly five years ago might find a way to, uh, to be the next good business to, to be in. So I think it's, it's really, and that's the kind of discussion I, I like to engage with uh, my clients because, I mean, we, we don't really, care. reporting is not the end game of it all, right? It's just a means to, to consider what really makes sense. So the good questions are, you know, what does this all mean for, for, for my business strategy? And when you start looking at this this way, then you're looking at cost in a very different way. And, and cost is no longer cost, it becomes an investment. Yep. And, and that's a totally different discussion. Mm. Leila, I mean, you work for one of the world's biggest financial services companies. If there's, a, if there's an industry that worries about the cost of regulation, then yours is probably it. Is this just yet another piece of costly regulation to have to deal with on top of all the other stuff that you've got going on? I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It, it, does, it does have a cost for, for organizations. But I think to Maud's point, it, it's, it's really about what you make of it. If, if you approach it from a, a regulatory box ticking mm. um, 
lens, then it's not going to be that valuable. I think reporting is, is meant to be the end of the cycle. You, you're supposed to be telling the story, a story about what you have been doing, how you have been approaching risk management you know, throughout the year, and, and also how you are identifying opportunities in relation to these EST factors. So if, if that's really how you're doing it, Actually, reporting should be fairly easy because you have been working on this, on it, you know, through, throughout the, the the way, all all the way. So, uh, yes, it's it's costly, and I actually I made a point before as well about the fact that there are so many frameworks and standards we are, we are being asked to comply with, and that's complex, and that's that's another risk of you know, potential inconsistency across all these frameworks. But at the end of the day, we are really trying to approach it in a way that is going to be valuable for the business, for how we, we shape our strategy and how we, we, manage, we, we navigate this uh, journey to you know, a more sustainable environment. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then one final question before we close. And I mean, Hans, you might be a good person to start on, on this one. So this question is saying, look, passive investments increased massively over the last few years. And we, we know that's the case. There are two things about that, aren't there? I mean, firstly, it puts huge pressure on asset managers' costs. You know, the, the passive management's all about cheap. How, how, so, you know, does that reduce their resources for this kind of engagement? And secondly, I suppose the more fundamental question might be, do passive investors actually care about this stuff? You know, they've, they've got to invest in these businesses because the index tells them to. Um, you know, do, do you see that as a sort of worry for the investment? You know, e either one of those factors is a... A potential concern? Yeah, I mean, cost clearly offers a cost and issue, but uh, I think we talked earlier about ESG and the importance of ESG, importance of stewardship, importance to be able to tell a little bit of a story. In, in this country, we have a stewardship code for investors, so where, where investors actually need to say, what are you doing once you own a share? And, and I think that has put a lot of uh, a very positive dynamic in getting all, all major asset managers really thinking about um, something that some investors have done for, for, for many, many years, um, in, including us. I, I would observe there's a lot of, there's a lot of hiring, there, there are more people doing this, but it, if you look at the cost compared to the potential benefits, then we are still very far off the sort of ideal um, resourcing of, of asset managers and everyone. So it's not still just need, passive managers who are struggling with the resources. No, it's not. Yeah. And, so, and some of the passive have um, significantly increased their teams um, also. Interesting. Mm. Okay. Mm. Brilliant. Look, we're just about out of time, um, so I'm going to wrap up. What I wanted to do before we, before we close down and say goodbye is just go around the room, actually, and ask for, for one sort of pearl of wisdom from each of you, if you like, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. Um, you know, I'm very conscious we've got a, an audience of people um, from audit committees, from people who work with audit committees. Um, you know, I suppose I'd, what I'd really like to do is leave them with one sort of piece of wisdom from each of you to think about some, um, you know, around the topics that we've just been talking about. What's, what's, the, you know, what's the one sort of call to action you'd think about for them? What's the one thing they should go away and think about in the context of navigating ESG in an audit committee um, uh, role? Leila, why don't I start with you to put you on the spot, seeing as you're, uh, you're out of my reach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, happy to go first. I, I think, I mean, we, we touched on it a, a couple of times during the discussion. The one thing I would, I would probably highlight is the importance of, of net zero transition planning. I think audit committees should definitely uh, start looking at this now um, and you know, challenging executives on, on what they are doing to, to plan that transition. Maybe, maybe your companies already have a target, you know, net zero target to 2050, but then how are we going to get there? What are the, the, the medium term, near, near term targets uh, on the way to, to 20, 2050 or 2040? And also engaging with customers and suppliers on their own transition plans um, because that's obviously going to influence your ability to manage your scope one, you know, scope, scope three emissions, so the, the whole value chain uh, emissions. So, that, yeah, net zero transition plans is, the, I think, the, the thing to remember. Brilliant. Thank you. Maud, you're up next. Um, I'll, I'll stay on the topic of transition, but not necessarily climate transition. I think we're all engaging in, in a very wide transition, right? Uh, much wider than just climate. And transition is important. It means we're, it's a journey. Uh, and I don't think uh, really focusing immediately on, on the end result is, is the best way to uh, navigate that, that challenging journey. I think 
it's important to, to consider and ask the right questions in the right order. And I think the, the first questions to be really um, uh, considered and, and challenged, including by the audit committee, is what are the risks, impacts, and opportunities my business is, is facing today? And what are the most material? And what do I need to, uh, to, to adjust my, my strategy to that? And the rest will flow quite naturally, right? But that, that's the first super important step. Brilliant. A good starting point then. Hands. <clears throat> yeah, this to the risk that people think I'm obsessed about financial accounts and <laughs> climate, <laughs> climate change. But I think really important message for audit committees and auditors to be able to, to demonstrate to investors um, there is thinking in the organization around how will climate impact upon financial statements and then being able to articulate this to, to investors and always thinking about um, we, we are all aiming for a Paris aligned pathway 1.5 degrees what is the impact for the company in financial statements I think this will be a really big topic over the next, next few years. Yeah. And that's been a theme all the way through our discussion, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shana, I've left you about 25 yeah, seconds. Really for your pearl. quickly, I think audit committees should oh, sorry, stick to their knitting. And basically, we're there to um, uh, look at the framework of, of controls um, and assurance over our major risk, the quality of data that we're, um, we're receiving in relation to those, and ESG is part of that. Brilliant. Well, listen, thank you all so much. Um, that brings us to the end of the discussion. And, you know, on behalf of both Board Agenda and the Centre for Audit Committee and Investor Dialogue, let me say a big thank you to all of you. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. I certainly feel like I've learned lots and hopefully our, our audience has been engaged and interested too. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Um, and thank you, everybody, for, for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.